I'll put it in the chat box. And what I can do is I can read the questions out or tell you that someone so has a question. Like a if they put it in the chat box, I have no trouble reading the chat box. Oh, okay, perfect. Okay. Elaine, I think we get started. Um, Absolutely. Okay. I want to welcome everybody. This is amazing. This is our probably our, I'm going to read everybody. All of us from young to old. Okay. Everybody is muted. Can you hear me? Just raise your hand so I know everybody can hear me. Perfect. Okay. Welcome, everybody. Very exciting. We have a great, great meeting for you. We have some of the greatest uh, elected officials on our call. Uh, we have a combination of the Average Term Marketing Council and the Primetime Business Network. My name is Michael Stern. Um, I'm going to be your semi-host for now, but Enid will take over in a few minutes. Uh, if you have questions, because there's so many people, we really need to use the chat box. So please use the chat box. And if we have time, we will go ahead and we will try to take questions live, depending on how quickly we can get through the program. Um, without further ado, let's get started. Elaine, anything you want to say before we hand it over to Enid? Okay, Enid, I'm going to unmute you. Actually, if you could unmute yourself. And Enid, I'm going to hand the baton over to you and uh, let's, let's do it. Enid? Enid, can you hear me? I can. Okay, I'm okay. unmuted. I, I just on my agenda, Gary went next. So I don't know if Gary wants to say a couple of sentences. If not, I, I'm going to go right into the program. Okay. Enid, I will turn the program over to you. Okay. All right. Um, we have really a number of dis distinguished guests. In fact, everybody on this program is a distinguished guest. And I want to welcome you to our first virtual Zoom town hall meeting. Elaine, I want to thank you. Time is really, really important. We've put together um, a list of topics that we at the city have gotten the most calls or letters about. But so everyone knows the people that are doing presentations today. In, in no specific order, let me just ask the senator just to introduce himself. I'll come back later with a question. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jason Pizzo, proudly serving 15 cities, including Aventura, Sunny Isles Beach, uh, most of the coast and interior cities. Uh, and I'm coming to you from Tallahassee. I'm sure Mayor Wiseman will get into why I'm here. Uh, but uh, I'm, I'm pleased to be here uh, and looking forward to getting back in the, in the room with all of you in an unsocially distant manner so we can uh, intimately discuss these details in the future. Joe, Joe, same thing, one minute. Unmute. You, we can't hear you. How's that? Better. Can you hear me? Okay, great. Yeah. Hi, I'm Joe Geller. I'm the state rep for, our, uh, for Aventura and the surrounding area. Um, I'm an Aventura resident, by the way, so that's my mayor. Yes, um, I want to introduce not just myself, but my coronavirus beard, which is making its debut today. Um, you know, when you don't see anybody and you sit at home, it's much easier not to shave. So thank you all very much. Uh, and um, although the senator's in Tallahassee, uh, I'm here hiding at home uh, with my wife and daughter, staying safe, but very glad to be on the call with everyone today. And I look forward to talking with you more and to um, taking some questions, hopefully. Okay, next person, same one minute, Martin Carp. Martin. Hi, Enid. Hi, Hi everybody. <laughs> All right, great to see everyone looking so good and uh, feeling well. All is good on our end. Obviously, we were kind of thrust in the situation to react as quickly as possible to address the needs of the students in Miami-Dade County. Uh, Again, Martin Carp, member of the Miami-Dade County School Board. It's uh, certainly been a challenging time, uh, and some of that I'll have an opportunity to talk about soon. But I think that a number of the students are handling it as well as could be expected. Uh, the teachers are putting in tremendous hours. A lot of people have dual responsibilities or beyond dual, where they're doing things for the home, doing things for the family, and also trying to deliver in the lessons. So again, it's been a trying times. There have been a lot of efforts to feed as many people as we can in the community and to show that we're not just a school district, but we're a family and part of this community. So again, it's a privilege to join all of you today. I think we would have had the student run breakfast uh, today or this week. So 
kind of odd not to have the kids with us, but it is what it is. And um, Aventura Marketing Council never stops, whether it's a pandemic or what, right, Elaine? Mm -hmm. Anyway, thank you for having me. You're welcome. And I don't know who you all can see on a screen or not see on a screen, but in no particular order, let me introduce Commissioner Robert Shelley. I, I don't know if he can wave his hand because I can't see him. Um, Commissioner Dr. Linda Marks. Commissioner Mizrahi, Gladys Mizrahi. Commissioner Mark Narotsky. Commissioner Denise Landman, and I don't know if you're seeing the waves, I'm not on my screen, and Vice Mayor Howard Weinberg. If I left anybody off, Michael or somebody that can see them, please help me. The only person that just joined that, not on the necessarily the agenda, is uh, Joe, Joe Gibbons. I don't know if you want to. Oh, uh, I know, yeah. Say. Okay, former representative, Joe Gibbons, and a friend. My predecessor. <laughs> I'm not going to introduce everybody else that's on here. Most of you know each other. It feels like family. It, it kind of looks like we're together in a Sunday afternoon to discuss what's going on. But with limited time and the number of people that are being impacted by this, let's hope, once in a lifetime coronavirus, I'd like to ask Senator Pizzo, because he's been on the front line for almost eight weeks now, dealing with a state defunct system um, in terms of being able to uh, deploy unemployment benefits. So Senator Pizzo, will you pick it up from there? Sure, uh, thank you, Mayor and, and everybody. And I know we have uh, Senator Ron Silver is on and Commissioner uh, Councilman Yaffe and uh, you have your Commissioner Narotsky as well and, and Vice Mayor Svenson. So hello again, everybody. Uh, yeah, so whether it's uh, yourself, your own family, somebody you know, uh, this is this is touching everybody. It's it's touching a very large, disproportionately large percentage of the able workforce, uh, and we are we have quickly learned uh, in, in an effort of deployment and assistance to a number of Floridians that the system uh, has had. I'll, I'll call it its challenges. Uh, I will tell you, without um, sounding overly dramatic, what we've discovered in the past almost 30 days up here in Tallahassee, I drove up here with, with Maggie, my chief, that many of you know, All the programs I've seen. is um, pretty scary. Uh, and so what's gonna come out is gonna be a committee and an investigation, also an inspector general investigation uh, of what happened. And just to give you by way of background, just to show you where we are, uh, Deloitte had been contracted in February, 2012 to develop the website that the, uh, for, for the unemployment system. Uh, they basically were contracted with the, with the state through May of 2015. Um, and what we've learned, even though they're named in a suit, we think they're going to be removed from it. Uh, we learned that certain policy changes were made uh, to effectively and, and yielding a more complicated uh, situation for the site and for trying to deliver uh, services. Uh, and this is a situation where it's, it's not only uh, dire, desperate, and, and unacceptable to the recipients, our phone calls and our emails from people have been about wanting to kill themselves, about shame that they feel in front of their families. But this is really a situation where, where companies and corporations and good community partners who have paid into this system on behalf of their employees are really having a difficult time trying to reconcile what's going on. And this is sort of a cautionary tale to businesses and individuals, small and large, to do and perform stress tests in advance of situations like this. And while we could not have foreseen something as, as, as widespread as this, uh, for, for the better part of March and beginning of April, our governor blamed prior administration and then blamed the director who was replaced effectively by another agency head, Secretary Satter. Uh, so we've been pushing and nudging. And uh, when this all comes out and the story's over, you're gonna, you're gonna read some interesting, intriguing things that, that, that have taken place up here in Tallahassee. Uh, especially over the past week. So we're slowly chipping away incrementally. Uh, I encourage anyone that you know and everyone that you know, uh, two things, and I've been saying this consistently for the better part of a month and a half. This is not the time to be ashamed and have cried. We have people who were riding high and doing well and living well just 45 days ago who need help. Uh, and this has been a great equalizer and a wake up call for a lot of people. But please, the very first thing I put up in the chat is my email, our office phone number, social media. We have like seven different types of mediums that, 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 we, that we receive messages from. We respond to everybody, every single person. Um, 
the greatest compliment I get is when someone's like, am I actually speaking to the Senator? And I, I answer yes. And, and we're doing, it's unhealthy, but we're doing 20 hour days right now. Um, and trying to field as, as, and do as much as we possibly can. But every single day we walk over to the governor's office or, or meet with DEO people or on the phone every single day, Saturday and Sunday, nonstop to, to chip away. And we, we've delivered a lot of success incrementally to our, to our constituents, but we're trying to help all Floridians. So the, the easiest thing I can tell you, the takeaway is please contact me if you or somebody you know uh, needs help. Uh, Senator, have you reached any number now of the percentage of people that have actually received dollars? If, in this situation, you wish it was as simple as person A applies and person A is either rejected or uh, is accepted. The issue is there's a number, there's a basket of people and as each stage along the way, things change. So when, when, when businesses were shut down, let's say in March and people were furloughed, those people that applied uh, who did not typically and traditionally qualify for Florida unemployment assistance like 1099, gig worker, independent contractor, self-employed. There are tens of thousands of people that applied in mid-March. Now, that was in advance of the March 29th passing of the CARES Act. And so what we're finding out, and I've been speaking, I've done 15 or 16 TV interviews on this, is that they call themselves the March filers in the black hole. And the reason being is that the present director, Ken Lawson of the DEO, either did not anticipate or did not take into account the fact that there would be a federal program as a stopgap measure. And so thousands of people, and I'm sure a few people that are watching here or know people, applied in March and they're lost. And what I mean by lost is, without anticipating a federal program would come through to make up the difference or to accommodate those, those people that otherwise would be ineligible, um, there was no attention or activity given to any of those applications. And those are the March filers. So we've heard that, and this, folks, this is not partisan. Representative Geller and I happen to be Democrat, but I have just as many Republican registered voters who are desperate to pay for food, for medicine, for rent, for car loans, for everything, uh, as I do Democrats or independents. So this is really not partisan. And I, I have to applaud my, a number of my Republican colleagues who have helped me you know, vouch for me, so to speak, when I'm trying to get meetings with, with certain people and they say, Pizzo's okay, it's all right, you can talk to them. Um, but yeah, there's a large swath of March filers. And then these patchwork hodgepodge band-aids were put on in an attempt to deflect or to appease the, the workload and capacity on the existing structure. So we were excited to announce that there was a new website uh, that they call PEGA. It's not a portal to actually successfully file an application. It's just a holding pattern. And when reporters ask me, well, what would you analogize it to? I said, it's like going to a restaurant and sorry, Mayor Wiseman, your table's not ready, but you can have a seat at the bar and have some nuts. And it's really just a holding pattern. It's not actually processing an application. You'll recall that the site was crashing so much that we urged and pushed for paper applications. And it got to the point that Maggie and I and Linda were out in the middle of the night delivering paper applications to people. Well, what's the problem with that? They go to a mail room at FSU, then they're, when they get around to it, they're manually entered into a system in place of, of having online access. But those paper applications didn't include bank account information. So now we're finding out that those people are offered and sent a debit card. And this, these, these vendors are saying, hey, it's gonna be 20 days before you get your debit card, but if you pay $14.99, we can expedite it for two day delivery. You know, these people are just hoping to get 275 bucks and these people wanna make $15. So, there's outrage whether people are voicing it or not on the other side, so to speak. Uh, but the March ones are the ones we're trying to get through. We've had better luck with April filers. The takeaway is if someone's actually applying, get to use the Connect system, uh, connect.myflorida.com. Do not use PEGA, which is RRA application. Do not use that. Use Connect. Do not send paper. But again, please reach out to me. We're, we're, we're able to navigate. Uh, things in minutes where people have to wait three or four hours on the phone. Thank you. I'm going to next go to- um, Actually, um, yeah. did, I'm sorry. Um, there's a question from Elaine in the chat box if you want to- Yeah, I saw that. Um, okay. I don't know if we want to take questions now or hold the no question until later because okay. I want to give everybody a chance. Is that okay, Michael? No, of course, you're running. I just wanted to make okay. sure you're aware of that. Yeah, I see it. Um, Joe, from your perspective, and you know we had talked, uh, I'd like you also to touch on the census. A lot of what we're doing is gonna be impacted by how we, please take it. <laughs> uh, 
Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, great. Hi, everybody. Um, thank you, and thank you, Senator Pizzo, for being up there on the firing line. Um, I know that it's got to be tough to be in Tallahassee now, and uh, I'm, I'm very grateful that you and your staff are up there working. Um, candidly, for health reasons, uh, we're not going up there, but I'm glad you are. Uh, I want to just start by putting my number out there as well. We're also happy to take calls. My staff is fully engaged, although our office is closed. That's 954-924-3708. And uh, uh, Mayor and also Elaine, if you guys, and Gary, if you guys can put that out there, we would appreciate that uh, so that people know. And it, you know, it's listed, of course, too. And we're happy to be responding to calls. I just want to take <clears throat> less than a minute but talk about the issue that Senator Pizzo talked about. We are just also swamped with these calls about unemployment. We've also had a lot of them about the so-called PPP, the Paycheck Protection. That's for small businesses, supposedly, to be able to keep their staffs employed. Tremendous problems with that. Uh, it's been very unfairly done. A lot of uh, much larger businesses than were intended have been getting those loans, and there have been a lot of problems that I've heard. Some of them are coming through for small business. We're happy to try and help with that. But as far as the March filers, my understanding, uh, which is not as extensive as the senators, but um, people who applied before they were ready, which is a date in the beginning of April, were simply rejected because they don't qualify for state benefits. They okay. can only qualify right. for the federal benefits, which are a little larger, by the way. Okay. So if you, you know, maybe. hello. Uh, somebody I'm needs getting, to. I, 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 Rita, I, I, I needed her. She's okay. good enough. So um, the, the point is what we've been told in our interactions is reapply. If you were rejected, reapply. And as uh, the Senator says, try to use the Connect system. Contact us. We can try to help. We can try to, to help push things through. Uh, frankly, sometimes that doesn't help much because they process as they process. But if you're in the black hole, reapply. And even if you're not eligible for our ridiculous poultry state benefits, 275 a week, um, the federal is 600 a week, so at least reapply and go after that. Uh, I want to jump right to the census. Uh, I, I cannot tell everybody how important that census is. It is critical. We have a lot of people in, in South Florida here who are not comfortable with revealing themselves. Some of them are undocumented or have other issues. They don't want to disclose information. The census, like the Internal Revenue Service, is entirely separate. People who answer the census, that is not information that's made available as to individuals to any other part of the government. Please stress that to people you know. But it is critical. It's not critical for political reasons, although it does directly influence how many representatives in Congress we're going to have, and that's a pretty important thing. We should grow and become even more significant in the next census. But grants are directly allocated based on population, and it's based on population in the census. Uh, there is belatedly, this. I've never seen a census that was like this one where the federal government frankly tried to abuse it to get information that wouldn't have helped but would have frightened people, made, made people even less likely to answer. So we're trying to overcome that. We're trying to overcome a late start in reaching out to people. They used to have these hordes of people who would go knock on doors that were employed, and that's probably not workable now. Census. Everybody you know, just say, Hey, have you done your census yet? Make sure, you know, uh, all kinds of people are not going to respond to the census that need to. So please, 
Uh, I want to take a, a moment and oh, talk let about- me go, Let me go on because we'll come back. Let me go on and we'll come okay. back. That's all right. Okay, next. And again, probably the one area that we've gotten the most requests for information about. And he's disappeared from my screen, but Mark- He's coming back now. He's, he's okay. logging on right now. Okay. He should be on now. I don't see him, but he just logged on. All right. I don't know if you can hear me, Dr. Carp, Marty. I can hear you loud and okay. clear. You know, yeah, you know, it's a good thing that I have the, the cell phone right here because for some reason <laughs> the, uh, the uh, laptop froze, but I'm here. Oh. And, uh, okay. Well, I said, which probably you missed, is there probably the single area that we get the most questions on. It's education, what's going to happen in the fall, what are the thoughts. I know that there are tens of dozens of kinds of surveys being sent out from the school system. So please take a couple of minutes and bring us up to speed. Okay, thanks a lot. And uh, great again to see everyone. I think first of all, I'll start off with some of the positives and the fact that uh, we have scheduled uh, and it's not just the uh, traditional schools and the charter schools have as well a number of virtual graduations and promotional ceremonies. Uh, we've seen last night there was a principal and assistant principal of the year recognition that that people were able to participate in and view. And I believe that uh, people have moved forward and have dealt with the circumstances. So in a positive light, at least the things are happening and people are, are celebrating successes. And I think we need to continue to do that. Uh, before I get to the main thing about moving forward, I do want to mention that the, uh, the superintendent of Miami-Dade County Public Schools and his staff have put out a parent survey, uh, wanting to see what the parents think in terms of next year and getting their feedback. I would like to say that what I think, given this is the Aventura Marketing Council, and there are a number of folks in the business community, I would like to know the perspectives from the business people. In other words, what are their feelings in terms of, obviously health is the main consideration, but you know, if we were to open up in some kind of a hybrid model, for example, where some students would be at home, some students would be at school, uh, or we have a, a variation of that with different schedules, like a morning and afternoon split schedule, I would like to know from folks in the business community uh, some of their thoughts on that type of format because it may have an impact. For example, I received an email from somebody uh, just uh, the other day about their going back to work and being in a situation that they can't leave a young child at home uh, where th they are at when she's at work, her spouse is at work. Uh, with high school students, it might be a little bit of a different picture. But so a lot of these things are up in the air. There's a great deal of uncertainty. There's been conversations about having students, uh, rather than all of them eating in the cafeteria, you have them eating in individual classrooms, or you might have uh, other ways to reduce traffic in the halls. I'm not so sure how that can actually be implemented with success. Uh, Mayor Weissman, you've been there, you know it. Um, as, as well as anybody, if not better. I personally think it's either one or the other. I do see a virtual platform for some of our educators who have pre-existing conditions, and it's not a matter of age necessarily. You could be a 25-year-old with diabetes or a 62-year-old with diabetes, and you can't go back into the school if schools were to reopen. So personally, what I see, and this is not coming from the superintendent or any of my colleagues, but just me, I see a system where you'll have some who have to use a virtual platform to teach or to learn if they're students with pre-existing conditions. And I think you'll see those that are in the brick and mortar environment back at the school grounds um, actually being at school as things were, taking the different precautions. But what I've said to a few people as I go back a few years, and certainly I know you'll remember this too, it kind of reminds me when I used to fly in an airplane and I used to fly in the no smoking section. Think about how silly that was really. I mean, you were in the same plane. So I really don't think if you reduce the number of kids 
you're still going to have students touching the railing, touching a door handle, no matter how careful you are. So I think really uh, we'll see a hybrid model for those who have to stay at home. But I believe at some point, it uh, looks like I would think that we would reopen. But again, there's no official statement on that. We're certainly going to look at the CDC guidelines and follow those recommendations. But I believe that, uh, I believe that the uh, one thing I can say is nothing is certain at this point. There is a school board meeting tomorrow. If anybody has any feedback they'd like to share with me, I'd be happy to discuss it at that point. I do have one of two agenda items. One deals specifically with um, an academic safety net for students looking at their fourth grade marking period because you see some students that have been working towards scholarships and have been working towards college admissions and have worked so hard and so diligently to do a great job. And because of their home environments, it's making it difficult for them to maintain their grades. It could be because a parent or both parents have lost a job. It could be because there's domestic violence and some of these kids are trapped in their homes. Um, you know, Enid, that a lot of the kids when you were a high school principal, loved to stay later, not only because they had interest in extracurriculars, but sometimes being at school was the best place for them to be. It was a safe place to be. It was a place where they could um, engage in, in healthy activities. And if you're trapped in home with people who may uh, have their own issues, whether it's addiction or other things, these students have a lot to overcome. And I'm hoping that at least in the last couple of weeks of school, in terms of the public schools, there's a consideration for what students are dealing with and also what some of the teachers are dealing with who have multiple responsibilities. In closing, for now, some of our students who are, are working are responsible for their younger siblings, they're cooking meals, they're cleaning, and doing all sorts of things during the course of the during the course of the day. So we have to be sensitive to that. We have to show emotion and, and do our best so that these students can uh, ultimately uh, have a good end of year. Martin, I want to thank you, but don't go away because we've got a few questions for you later. Sure. Um, next, and I think uh, Commissioner Dr. Linda Marks, your, your talk about an emotional hotline keys right into what Senator Pizzo and Representative Geller said. So would you please talk about that? You don't want them to see you. Thank you, Mayor. So early on in um, yeah. the stay at home, the beginning of stay at home, one of the things that I was seeing is that people were not used to staying at home. Their parents were asked to work at home, but they have children who are at home and parents didn't know whether they should become their children's teachers or whether they should do their work. And it was a rude awakening, uh, again, for Dr. Karp, I'm sure you know this, as does Mayor Weissman. Um, many times through my career as superintendent, I would hear, especially from business, I would hear, um, oh, what's the big deal to be a teacher? You know, they only work 10 months a year, and so it's a really easy job. And, and I was able to um, shift people's opinions by bringing in those CEOs to teach. And I can tell you that the longest a CEO lasted in the classroom was about two hours. And they walked away with a tremendous respect for, for what teachers do because it takes a very special person to be a teacher. And all of a sudden moms and dads and aunts and uncles are put in this position where the kids are saying, I don't understand this. And they're going to mom and dad. So you have the stress of your job at home. You have the stress of having children at home. You have seniors who are alone at home, and all of a sudden, a huge population of people have no paycheck. And not only have no paycheck, but as uh, Senator Pizzo so aptly said, along with Senator Geller, uh, with Representative Geller, is um, there's no way to get the money, even in terms of getting money for you know a weekly check, no matter how large or small it is. So there, there was a very large. Um, development of people who were really facing stress and did not know where to go and deal with it. So our city, um, we, we asked the city if we could go ahead and put in a hotline. And I want to thank the whole the whole commission for really allowing me to to work on this project. And um, along with um, our city manager Ron Wasson, uh, we worked together. I literally called every single hotline probably in the U.S. to find out what their 
model was and what worked and what didn't work. And we ultimately were able to really work with Florida Blue right down here. It had set out a COVID-19 hotline specifically for these kinds of issues. We have had hundreds, hundreds of hits on our website just looking for that number and looking for that information. And I encourage anyone listening on this call, if you know anyone who needs it, please share, just go to the website, go to our website and it'll direct you over to our the hotline. There is no charge, it is bilingual, but there, there's a tremendous amount of stress. And a lot of folks don't even realize that they're under stress, but they're acting differently. And you know, again, talk to someone. Talk to someone, encourage others to talk to someone. And we really, I, I think our whole commission, we're very proud of the fact that we're able to offer this and we're looking forward to people using it. We're also looking forward to the time when we won't need it anymore, but we know that that's not in the immediate future. So thank you, Mayor, for allowing me to share that information. Yeah, I think I think it's important that the community knows that there are that there is a number and should they need it, there will be services provided. Um, mm -hmm. Vice Mayor Wine. No charge, by the way. And, and I've got a steady stream of questions that's going to impact most of our panelists. So I, I, Vice Mayor Weinberg, and I can't see any other commissioners. So again, Michael, you're going to have to be my eyes and ears, or they can use the chat. I have seen a few questions from them in the chat box, and I'll get back to that as soon as Commissioner Weinberg gives his little update. Did, did you see my, my uh, quick message to you? It'll, it'll solve your problem. Yeah, with the three dots, yes. Yeah, okay. Mayor Wiseman? Yes. If I may just quickly, there was a, a question about the census after Rep Geller gave their presentation. Uh, there may be some confusion. The deadline it was not April 1st. So April 1st is, was the uh, you know unofficial sort of census day, but it continues all the way through December and then the, the, the final count is delivered to Congress. So it's all through this year. I, like mo most of you, received something in the mail but you don't actually don't, and I don't know what I did with it. So you can go on, uh, on census2020.com and you can actually dug up and you can actually uh, fill it out right there. And then the April 1st is the benchmark date for who's been living or staying with you during that period of time. And to Rep Geller's point, folks, this is the time that you want to tell housekeepers and landscapers and everybody to fill it out. The question of citizenship is neither included nor is any of this information used. It is locked away for years and not available for public view, but it is used for essential services for our police departments, for our county, for all types of services as it relates to roadways and, and all types of federal programs. So when you see Congress going through a special session to dole out dollars based on uh, per capita and based on need, it's all based on census data. So if we're not complete and we're not accounting for ourselves, we get less. And then we have to put a strain on municipal and county services to make up for the shortfall. So there is no deadline until the end of the year. Please just go on. It takes nine minutes. Uh, and you can do it on your phone. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Vice Mayor Weinberg. Thank you, Mayor. Just uh, two items briefly. Uh, we, as most of you know, we had a parade last week for the high school seniors that reside in Aventura and were graduating from high school. It didn't matter what high school they were graduating from. And uh, we just knew they didn't have prom. They weren't gonna walk in the traditional manner. It was uh, the brainchild of Michael Stern. And it, it seems like we tapped into almost a pressure release valve. I don't think anyone anticipated uh, how emotional it would be uh, it's not a good time to be spending taxpayer dollars. So since I'm out there almost every day anyway, I just started asking and people wanted to give, people wanted to help. And without spending any taxpayer dollars, we were able to provide um, sort of a swag bag or a goodie bag for every student. They all got one of these great fearless baseball caps. They got t-shirt, they got a class of 2020 mask, which I'm sure they'll probably keep forever. God willing, they're the only class that will ever need them. They got coupon for free pizza. They got a book that tells them uh, how to become a millionaire. They got a uh, USB jump drive. They got an individually wrapped cupcake, a uh, water bottle. And we had our uh, SWAT armored vehicle. We had the fire trucks from Station 8. Uh, we had uh, uh, 
mo police motorcycles and the cars were decorated uh, by the students. Really a lot of fun and they wore the merch for the colleges that they would be attending. And uh, you know, you could sense the smile behind the mask, which is exactly what we were looking for. And it was just an amazing event and everyone should be extraordinarily proud of, of everyone in Aventura. Okay. Um, right now, there are a lot of questions and I want to make sure people get answers. So I'm going to go right in the order and then we'll go back for some more statements. Um, the first one is from Elaine and I'm going to send it to Jason. It's about EIDL. I actually responded in the chat just for her to, to email me. We, we've seen a, a number of issues as it relates to PPP, uh, EIDL, the emergency grants and all that stuff. Sometimes it's bank specific, sometimes it's, it's, it's answer specific. Uh, there was a Florida bridge loan fiasco where they only allotted 50 million. It was gobbled up by a thousand companies before 35,000 know, could get in the door. So I actually re responded uh, in the chat just to email me and then I can look at an individual one. We've, we've been helping a number of businesses at different levels of different loan products. Uh, we just did it last week where we did a, a presentation. Uh, and I, I will tell you, I'm not, I'm not stumping for any particular company, but I will tell you going forward, a lot of, a lot of things, lessons we've learned is some smaller banks uh, develop a relationship with smaller banks. Um, and I don't mean that as, as an affront to anybody else, but just objectively, those people who have had longstanding relationships with the big guys like Chase and Wells Fargo and all that uh, were basically not given the service that the smaller regionals, you know, were able to give, and the success rate of, of place of loan placement and procurement was a lot was significantly higher at smaller institutions. One other thing I want to mention, because I know this is going to be on everybody's mind to some extent, if I may, I apologize. Uh, we, we've asked our congressional colleagues to take a, a hard look. I've asked a few people, and they've been receptive. We're going to be really pushing for basically a March through September forbearance on negative credit reporting. Uh, what's going to compound the issues here as it relates to the sharp, sharp, steep uptick in and drastic and sudden unemployment is the shock of people having to, for the first time, really triage how to allot whatever finite number of dollars they have. And so I, I will tell you that, that, that I, I would surmise that everybody on this call would be sooner to feed their child than they would be to pay a car loan. But what's going to happen and compound the problem, trying to come out of this in a reopening, uh, really, is going to be that. Uh, when you made those priority decisions based on unavailability of unemployment or PPP or EIDL, you know, you, you bought medicine and, and fed your kids uh, before you paid your rent or before you paid your car loan or utilities. Uh, so we're working on all of those things. I spoke with FPL yesterday. I said, listen, I, I want something clear and, and definitive from you. I don't want, if people have diligently and in good faith applied for assistance and have not received it, I want you guys to develop a mechanism, even if it's the claim number, so, so those people are not turned off and those, 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 there's no negative credit reporting. Just think about it. When we come out of this, if we're trying to resurge in the economy and I lose 150 points on my credit score, I can't get a car loan. I can't get a mortgage. I can't get any of those things that are necessary for any type of recovery anywhere in, in, you know, in our democracy. So um, I'm telling okay, you that. Senator, I, I've got a question from Commiss Commissioner Ms. Rahi and I'm going to give it to Joe. She's heard that people cannot reapply. Joe, we can't hear you. How's this, better? Much. Okay, that's directly contrary to what we've been told, Commissioner. Um, they, you know, my staff has been on the phone as recently, I think as, uh, as Friday or yesterday, with um, legislative affairs at DEO, and they're saying that you need to reapply if you were rejected, because a lot of these rejections or that people were found ineligible is because they don't qualify for the state program because they were not traditional workers. But the federal program is much more inclusive, and that's $600 a week. Now, you know, some people may be able to get both. But Joe, but they're talking about, she's talking, she's talking about EIDL, not about, not about unemployment. The, no, uh, I thought she was talking about no, unemployment. No, no, economic well, injury so. disaster loan. Right. No, actually unemployment as well, because I've gotten a lot of calls that when they are not eligible, they have tried to reapply and it says, no, you're not eligible, forget it. 
because okay, it that's helps what, social security. Anybody that has an unemployment saying. question, just email me individually. I'm happy to okay. answer it. Just send out my email address. All right, and I will say but to any of our guests. Tell them to reapply as well. They should try to reapply because uh, we've directly gotten that guidance. Again, they can contact the senator's office. He's up there. That's great. You're welcome to contact us as well. But absolutely tell people if they were rejected, particularly because they're 1099s or self-employed or something, they should be able to reapply into the system, uh, you know, if they can get through, which is another problem. But and we don't, we don't are, think we'll... We don't think we'll answer every question sufficiently. So as Senator Pizzo said, if in the chat, you will type in your name, your phone number, how people can get in touch with you. There's, there's a great question from Charlie Orviedo. Um, we've, we've rehired our employees. Question, what happens after the eight weeks of PPP loan forgiveness? And it's not enough work to keep the employees busy. So which of my two electeds would like to try and field that one? Joe, Jay? Jason, go ahead. I'm, I'm happy to take it. I, I, I don't disagree. The imbalance is, it's incongruous to have 25% or 50% capacity when in theory that by itself, even if even at full occupancy at 50%, really is not sustainable for a number of businesses that, that you have and that, that are in the marketplace. The one advantage though of PPP, so long as you're, you're honoring the 75, 25% split on payroll versus you know, uh, you know, overhead and other operation expenses, it, it is actually a fast track forgivable, uh, a, a number of dollars that don't come out of your business that are forgivable to, to pay your employees. At some point, if, if you have the intention in the long term to resume normal business activity and get and get back to, to full operation, anything that bridges, especially a loan product that's forgivable, anything that bridges you to the next step to get back to 100% operation, 100% efficiency, uh, you should take. PPP is actually a wonderful program. Uh, as of last week, there were still 140 billion left, but I think they, they blew through that. I think we're gonna have another round of something. Again, my takeaway to you is this, People had greater success going on AmericanExpress.com, PayPal, and Axion than they did trying to go to a traditional bank, uh, a bricks and mortar place of a national chain. So we're going to see another round. You know, Congress was looking at $3 trillion for city and, and, and state bailouts. Senate last night whittled it down to about a $500 billion package. Um, but yeah, the answer is PPP is a necessary bridge. The problem is, the, is, is consumer sentiment and consumer comfortability. Uh, Looking at this whole chat here, there's a few of us who, who have no problem going back to a ball game psychologically, and a few that would ne that may curtail and curb their their habits and enthusiasm for the marketplace in perpetuity, and it's that blend. Um, but yeah, I think there's going to be a restructuring of the actual retail marketplace for a lot of people psychologically. But if you have PPP, use it. It's not enough to bridge, but it's better than nothing, and it's forgivable. It's not money owed if you're using it appropriately. Okay, the next question is from Alan German, and it's for you, Senator Pizzo. Who do I contact about payments not received in connection with the FPUC government supplement? Will Me. state benefits be extended Me. after 13 weeks? So Florida is, is the slowest to actually bring in what's called PEUC. This is a whole alphabet soup of acronyms, but there's PUA, PU, PUC, PEUC, uh, and I had a lot Facebook live webinar with Secretary Satter who's overseeing unemployment on April 30th and said that that link would be up and available to everyone in Florida within five to seven days and here we are May 19th. Uh, it was supposed to launch yesterday. It did not, didn't work, uh, and, but it's supposed to be coming sometime this week. At this point, really everyone should understand that if you are unemployed due to COVID, there is some program you are eligible for. Now, the easiest way to describe it is to all of you, and you can take this and, and disseminate it how you will. If you had basically 15 prior months of uninterrupted W-2 employment, you are the perfect garden, you know, pure vanilla uh, uh, eligible applicant in the state of Florida for up to $275. If you're 1099 gig worker, independent, independent contractor, 
uh, and you work with miscellaneous income or, 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 or an outsourced third party provider, you were traditionally not eligible, but the federal government recognized that states like ours have a huge swath uh, of people like that. So now there's the program for them as well, which is you know PUA. And then there are some people who, not just some, thousands of people who had previously applied for unemployment assistance have exhausted the benefit available to them in Florida, but the federal government realizes those people should not be left out in the cold. So now there's the PUC as long, along with the PUA that picks up that, that, that difference. The federal government will pay the state's portion if you're not otherwise eligible for the state portion from the state. The biggest problem has been that all 50 states act as the dispersing agent for their own citizens. So how slow Florida goes with their state unemployment matching slowness, if you will, uh, as it relates to dispersing federal dollars. The federal 600 a week comes from the state of Florida. They are the dispersing agent. And so how slow they go is, is obviously compounds the pressures here. Okay, um, I think that we, we did answer that the April 1st census deadline has been extended. So I'm going to go on to school board member Martin Karp uh, with a question from Chantal Malord Grace. Um, do we have any information on the release of education stabilization funds? Okay, thank you. I don't have any information on that right now. Certainly, that information, and perhaps we'll have that on Thursday, because um, we can discuss it tomorrow at the school board meeting, and the superintendent will be there Thursday. So I'll note that question, and... Um, and see what what information we have. I probably have some in my inbox because uh, we get uh, daily memos and updates on what's happening, uh, not only from the federal but from the state level. So uh, I, I do not want to answer without having all the details, but we'll get them to you. Okay, Dr. Karp, I have another question for you from Cliff Shulman. High schools should be on split shifts. We did this back in the 70s. May not work for younger kids, but possibly could work for high schools. Any comments? Right. Um, yeah, I don't, I do know that it's effective and it's worked before, but I don't see how that would uh, particularly help in this situation because let's say you have a split schedule and you have kids there from seven in the morning till noon. Now you have another group coming in from one to, to five or whatever, one to six. Uh, you're not going to be able to desanitize the school and you're still going to have hundreds of students in the different shifts. So it's not going to be able to um, address the issue in terms of spreading coronavirus. You're still going to have hundreds of kids in each of the shifts. So I, I really don't believe that in the end, that kind of a schedule will help in terms of the, uh, in terms of the virus and the spreading of it. Uh, certainly, it, it's something that we've talked about in the past in terms of utilization, not having to build additional facilities and traffic and things like that. But there's just no way you can desanitize and do all the things that are needed within that short period of time. And even so, you have, uh, uh, again, a lot of students in, in both shifts. Thank you. Um, next question for Dr. Linda Marks. Can we please have more information on the hotline? And this is from Amanda from Exclusive Translations. I would like to promote it through our social media. We will do it in different languages so everybody has access to this very important service. Dr. Marks. If you will um, just send your email address to uh, Elaine, she'll forward it to me and I will be happy to then get it over to the city manager and we'll get you the information that you need. We're happy to do that and thank you for the translation offer because that's the more people we help, the better it is. Okay, and I think a question that's on everybody's mind, Senator Silver, um, and I'm not sure who has that crystal ball, but what are we doing to prepare for the fall if there is a second wave? And Senator Silver, can you talk to this for a minute? Unmute. Unmute yourself. Um, I am very concerned. Obviously, we're dealing with a current problem right now, and we're paying attention to that. But I'm concerned about what's going to happen in October and November and December if there is a second wave, because we are affected by it here more than anybody else, because we have the winter people coming down here to fill up the condominiums. And I'm, I'm wondering if we ought to be setting up some sort of committee to make sure the uh, equipment is going to be here uh, for the hospitals and, and all that. I, I just, 
I'm confused as to what, if we learned anything from this, how we're going to be applying it to that second wave. And by the way, I want to say one other thing, uh, Mayor, is Senator Pizzo is going way above the duty <laughs> of, of any senator, okay, that I've ever seen, all right? He's up there working during the summertime. And I know, Representative Gelly, you agree with that, and you're doing a great job also, and you look like a rabbi. But in any event, um, <laughs> Senator Pizzo is doing an outstanding job, and I communicated that with him. Um, you know, Ron, I can tell you I will put that question on my next week, um, the municipal mayor's meeting, and we'll address it to the county mayor in terms of if they are doing any preparation for a second wave. Uh, I'll tell you, um, they're doing tremendous preparation in every single city for what we're currently dealing with. Um, but let me go on and see if there's anything more here. Okay, from John Lazell. Understand it's federal, not state, but can you comment on stimulus payments? So I actually, I answered in the chat. Um, yeah, okay. what, I ask people, what I ask people to do is, and we're happy to orient them, but if that's purely a federal issue. And so our congressional colleagues have had a better luck navigating the IRS. We have a packet from the congressional offices on frequently asked questions. And Joe, I think wants to answer, but um, on the stimulus, Joe, go ahead. But just copy us on stuff like that, and then we follow up, whether it's Debbie's office, Donna's office, so on. Yeah, there is a website you can go on as well. It's, uh, I think it's called Track Your Check, but there's a federal website. We've actually tried it, and, you know, you have to enter certain information, and it'll tell you, you know, has your check been sent or when it's scheduled to be sent. They're still sending them out, and uh, you can distribute that information. Anybody can go on. You should have, it's helpful if you have your last tax return handy because they may ask some information, but there is a website that's available to every individual to look and see. If, I mean, if you're not scheduled to get one, absolutely call your Congress member right away. But otherwise it can tell you, yes, your check is being mailed out, for instance, this coming Friday. So you're not worried that it's lost. You just know that you need to keep track of it. Thank you. Mayor okay. Wise, but also we found that some people that use H&R Block or TurboTax or some other third-party software uh, that had some luck contacting them because it's actually being filed through their software, through their system. And I know a number of H&R Block people have contacted them uh, to help navigate that system. I'm posting right now the website about where's my payment right now in the chat. Okay, and Commissioner Thanks. Mizrahi has a question that I think everybody wants to know about. And, is there any help regarding the credit card interest rates? It's on a case-by-case -case basis. We've seen it with utility companies, communication companies, and credit card companies. They don't want defaults. They don't want bad debt. Um, and, and, and basically, on a case-by-case -case basis, they've been, they've been uh, very receptive uh, based on your history, based on your circumstances. They, they have their, their fingers on the pulse of what's going on in different regions, especially those that are service oriented more so than manufacturing sectors and things like that so they've been very receptive uh when we have communication with the florida banking association as it relates to, to those lenders remember this is also loans too we're, we're, we're all sensitive to the, the shopkeeper the barbershop the dry cleaner whatever they have landlords and those landlords also need to cover debt service uh insurance payments you know light heat power all that stuff and so if they're not getting attendant and commensurate relief or forbearance from their lenders on their Was I muted? I apologize. <laughs> I couldn't hear you, but okay. That, that's okay. Let me really, because I know time is, is important. Let me really try and read um, some, of the, some of the questions. Um, and uh, from, from Rita, what happens to the employees that can be rehired, but for less hours than before COVID-19? I responded already. So long as the part-time um, employment... So long as the part-time employment is not in excess of $275 per week, they still qualify for unemployment. I'd answer that in the chat. Okay. From Anchor Kapoor, Interim Healthcare in Texas, they are talking about, this must be a school-related one. Um, of course, my thing is moving. In, in Texas, they're talking about split shifts in days, two days, three shifts, uh, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Martin, I don't know if it's education or not, 
but I'm sure you're, it's one of many plans you're looking at. Uh, yes, so it is one of many plans that, uh, that we're looking at. But again, I think that uh, if we're trying to uh, keep everyone safe, I don't believe that that's going to uh, solve that. And of course, that other things come into play. Students who, especially in the high school years, who have um, jobs or internships, if there are <laughs> any of those things happening, depends where we are with all of this, um, or who participate in some kind of extracurricular activity. A lot of different logistical things that would come into play. But again, I I, again, I don't know how you can do all of the sanitization efforts in such a short period of time uh, for the next shift or for the next day. Even if you have staggered uh, days for, for students, the fact of the matter is every day the school will have students. Every hour the school will have students. And so, yeah, so if you have a school that has 2,000 kids and now you only have 1,000, you still have 1,000. Uh, so I'm really not sure uh, and then you're going to expose younger children uh, in after school programming. Uh, so because the parents are going to have to put their kids somewhere. So if they're not going to be exposed at a regular public school or, or a charter school or in the private schools or wherever these things are happening, they're going to be participating in after school programming because of parents who have to work uh, to earn a living. Uh, so I think that, again, uh, I, I really believe that uh, those staggered schedules or split days will not solve the problem as it stands right now. Okay, um, Senator Pizzo has written to a number of people already that um, if you haven't received your stimulus check, reach out to your Congresswoman. If you live in this district, hey. that's Debbie Wasserman Schultz and CC him. Okay, I'm gonna go on and there was something, um, okay, from Cliff Shulman, question regarding mandatory evacuation in the event of hurricane. Where do we go, city plans? I'm gonna give that to the city manager, Ron Wasson. Hi, Mayor. Um, just so you know, every year we go through planning process uh, through the county. We get together at a, at a, at a meeting over at FIU, usually hosted uh, by Commissioner Heyman. Uh, all the agencies from the county get together really just to touch base to see if there are any new faces. But we work very closely with the county and go over all our evacuation plans. All the police departments are involved. Uh, certain stores are also um, involved in this meeting like Home Depot and some of the big box stores for, uh, for resources or supplies should they become short. Uh, we keep lists. I know the police department, I know Brian, uh, the chief of geese is on the call. The police department maintains lists of people who um, in crisis situations, if we had to evacuate people who they would target or help to make sure they could get them out. And that we do our own uh, start at the season, try to push out um, the information that you do need to develop your plan, make sure you go over it, uh, make sure you have things in your apartment or your residence such as water and things to keep your, you know, self-sustained for so many hours and make sure that everybody has that responsibility to do that. We have a several different ways we can communicate with residents either by, um, obviously we can do it over social media, but we also have code red, which reaches out to everybody and give you, can give emergency uh, information as needed. All right, so, so that's, thank you. Thank you, city manager, but I think, and I think it's really important and we've got the right people maybe on this call. I think his question had to do with evacuation and it's, it's a new normal. So there's, there's going to be things that the county has to think about in terms of evacuating people. And we know where the evacuation zones are. So, it, and I'm not sure anybody has the answer, uh, Cliff, but uh, the city manager has a regu regular meeting with all the city managers of every municipality. So Ron, would you please bring that up on your end about what we're gonna do with evacuations? Because they're gonna have to rethink what they've done in the past. Right. Does that make sense? Yes, yes, we can, those, those plans are shared with us. They change slightly, but usually for evacuation centers, how do we get people from the, from the city to the evacuation centers? Okay, I have three other commissioners. Um, and again, Michael, my, my technology deficits, I can't, I can't see them and I've tried to do the three dots. But uh, 
Mark Narotsky, Bob Shelley, Denise Landman, if e any of the three of you would like to speak, I, I have no way of recognizing you. So please just chime in. Hi, Mayor. Hi. Commissioner Landman here. Um, as you know, as a communications professional, I think I, I want to welcome everyone to this important conversation. I think I just my concern or, or the way I look at things as we begin to reopen our city, as businesses begin to reopen and we're, we go to a new normal, I always I want to make sure that our constituents and our residents are aware of what is happening, how, what the precautions are you know, our parks, what we're doing to ensure safety and all that. So I always want to hear feedback, especially from the business community. You know, if there's something that you see or an idea or you have a doubt about something, we're here to answer those calls. We're here to, you know, share information with you. And, you know, we, we just want to be responsive. We want to make sure that you feel safe, that you feel protected, that you feel that, you know, we're offering services in, in a manner that is, safe and and that people can enjoy those services with all the precautions that we are currently having to take so really we just want to hear from the community the business community if you see something if you have an idea or a suggestion or feedback we welcome all of that as your representatives in this community okay um either mark or bob yeah mayor this is bob shelley yeah. uh real very quickly uh you know i live over at williams island and we have about five thousand residents in uh, on the island uh, but what we hear the most and the biggest concerns we're having is because the press is making, you know, a lot of information out to us regarding the hurricane season and the anticipation that this could be one of the worst seasons we have, et cetera. I think that combined with the virus and the ability or inability to put people where they might need to go, where they would want to go, et cetera, I think is one of the biggest issues that we face on the island right now because obviously we're in a mandatory evacuation zone most of the time. So I know there's no definite answer today, but I think in addressing it, that's probably the number one question I get as president of the association. Where do we go? How do we get there? What's being done about it? And what are the island's plans, meaning Williams Island, what do we intend to tell the people, et cetera? So I don't want to belabor the point now because I think it was already raised, but I think that to me and probably any of the people in the high rises here, that's <laughs> probably the biggest question that we're all getting right now. And I'm sure the Senator and the House Representative are getting the same questions. So I leave it at that, but I think that's something that we should be addressing sooner than later. Thank you. Okay, so let me let me turn that question to Chief Pegues. I know that we've got representatives on the emergency management team for the county. I don't know where you are in your plans yet, but I think that uh, Commissioner she Shelley's concerns, as was addressed earlier, are very important, um, particularly when it comes to evacuation time. We have tons of empty hotels, but it it's going to have to be thought through differently. So, Chief? Hi. Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, thank you for having me. For those of you that don't know me, I'm Chief Brown. But yeah, we have uh, a couple of upcoming meetings with the uh, Emergency Operations Center with the county and also with Commissioner Heyman um, to go over our evacuation sites and plans. Um, typically, the evacuation sites are not put out um, for public knowledge um, until um, right before an evacuation policy of, of the... Uh, we have visited all our ALS <laughs> generators. Um, are all up and running, and we've also um, we've also made sure that they all have evacuation plans out of out of uh, the county to different uh, various facilities, which they did in the last storm, and they went out. Um, so we're working hand in hand with them, and I, and once we get the what the protocol for the county is going to be, we will definitely push that out to everybody. But we are working diligently behind the scenes to uh, uh, work through this new normal and how we're going to be evacuating for everybody. Okay, um, I just lost my screen. Uh, Mark, is there anything you would like to say? Uh, no, I don't have anything to add. I, I think that everybody here has been fantastic. So my two cents uh, won't add much, but thank you to everybody. Well, two cents is two cents in these days. It, it seems higher than the interest rate. <laughs> um, I don't know how to 
thank all uh, Senator Geller. I'm sorry, Representative Geller. Yes, my brother was Senator. 60 seconds before we go, I've been working a lot on voting and we're gonna have a real problem with voting. And I just wanna say two words to everybody. Signature update. If you're thinking about voting by mail, if you have friends who are gonna vote by mail, we're gonna have a big surge in mail voting. We think there may be expanded early voting as well. But if you know anybody who's even thinking about voting by mail, they must update their signature. If they haven't done it recently, they haven't done it in a long time, or they've never voted by mail, they walk in and, and they're recognized and they used to go to their rec room. If you don't update your signature, you may end up not having your vote count. Signature update, everyone. Thank you. Where do we go to do that? You have to fill out the form, the regular voter registration form, and send it into the elections. Now, I spoke uh, a week ago with the Secretary of State. We're trying to see if they can adopt an emergency rule to allow those same forms to be sent in electronically by email. I don't see why they shouldn't. They have allowed electronic submission for uh, candidate signature petitions, but the, it's a regular form for voter registration. It's online on the supervisor. We can provide it to anybody. That for right now, mail them in, but we are working on getting them to accept them electronically. But everybody should update their signature. Everybody, even if you say, no, I'm not gonna vote by mail, get that signature update in now anyway. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Um, I know our time is, is coming to a close. Michael, am I correct? Yeah, so I think um, Black, uh, Commissioner Viswahi, uh, okay, was a good was, student, raised her hand. So I don't know if Gladys, you want to say something? Uh, yes, thanks, Michael. I just want to say that um, I just finished a partnership mm -hmm. with a, an international organization called Pandemic of Love, and we opened the chapter in Aventura. And the way it works is that if you need help to pay your bills, electric, FPL, all of the bills that have been piling up, that organization matches you with somebody that wants to help. So the Aventura chapter is already open. It's being handled by volunteers. And I think in the next two or three days, uh, it's gonna be up and running. So those that really need help, please have them email me and we can get them the cash they need to pay their bills. Thank you. Michael, there was a question I got. Is Are people going to be able to go back in and watch this? Yes. Yes. This will be sent uh, throughout Elaine's database. Elaine will, I'm sure, email everybody. Um, yeah. She's so shaking if, her head yes. If, any, if anybody needs this, please contact Elaine. I would also ask one question for everybody listening, and that is please let us know as a city, as a municipality, what we can do better to serve you. Don't think of it as a complaint. It's really extremely helpful to us to know. And as you can see, we can master whatever resources we need to be able to get the information in an ever-changing world. And now the ever-changingness is from five minutes to the next Twitter. So please, if, if you tell us what you're having problems with, we will get it to the next person. Um, with that said, from the bottom of my heart, I want to thank well, everyone. Sorry, I have a very special thank you. I have a very special thank you here from Randy Stern that I would like to read. I wanted to thank the city of Aventura, the mayor, the commissioners, our amazing Aventura Police Department, and the Aventura Mall for helping make the 2020 senior graduation parade such a success. The students, the parents, and even the residents on the sidelines were so grateful. It's hard not to end on a high note. So with that said. Actually, I'm sorry, Mayor, before you go. Yeah. Um, I was overwhelmed at the beginning of the meeting. Usually I let uh, the chairman of the marketing council, Gary Pyatt, speak. I think Gary wants to say a, a couple of closing words. Okay. Oh, and it, it will be short. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Mayor, for hosting us and, and coordinating with, uh, with Elaine and Michael for everything. Senator Pizzo, as always, thank you very much. Joe, my friend Joe, thank you for your time today, Martin, all of the all of the Aventura commissioners, and I was scrolling through on my, commu my computer, I have three pages that I was looking through to see who was participating. So 
uh, Robert and Linda and Denise and Howard and Shelly and everybody. Thank you guys so, so much for today, Ron um, and Gladys and everybody that participated today. I was scrolling through the questions as people were going, and there were some really great questions, I, I think, today that not only dealt with uh, COVID, but schools and some other things. So again, uh, I appreciate and sincerely thank everybody for being on today with us. Elaine, as always, thank you for coordinating and, and thank you for everything you did. And Michael, I like your picture. It's the same one as yesterday, but it's mm. nice. Thank you very much. I'll change and, it next uh, time. Again, Michael, thank you for everything you've done in coordinating all the programs for us. Thank you. And Mary, Gary, Weiss, you thank a fabulous you. job. Michael, Elaine, let's think about doing a follow-up in two months. Wonderful. Okay, Sounds I think, great. We'll, thank I you, think it'll give Martin a chance to really get a firmer footing on what Tallahassee is doing in terms of education and the school system. And, you know, so if we can maybe tend to, you know, Elaine, we will work with you, but let's set up a part two. Oh, I forgot real quick. Thanks, Chief Piggies. Thank you down there in the bottom. Thank you. Well, on my screen, he's up at the top. <laughs> uh, Mayan, he's at the bottom. Thank you all. I really appreciate it. You're what makes Aventura so special. Thank you. Great job. Fabulous meeting. Stay safe. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you, Thank everyone. You. Bye. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you all. Been great. Well, I'll get you all the uh, recording very soon, as soon as Michael sends it to us. Thank you, Elaine. Bye. Welcome. Thank you, guys. Bye. Bye-bye. I got that stuff for you. Bye-bye. 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 Hi, Margie. <laughs> Alexis, hi. <laughs> Bye, Elaine. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.